Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. It is good to be with you this morning on a sunny day to worship the Lord together. I want to draw your attention to a few announcements in the bulletin. Please take time today or this week to see all of the many ways that you can get involved here in fellowship and in serving and in worship. But two things I wanted to draw your attention to are that we have been invited to a Seder dinner next Sunday, April 14th, at Temple Emmanuel. This is the first planned activity through Westminster's Dismantling Anti-Semitism team, and it is a really great opportunity to get to know our Jewish neighbors, to learn from them, and to also have a time of fellowship and growing community at Temple Emmanuel. So there's an RSVP for that that you will see in the bulletin. If you're interested in coming, please RSVP, and I hope a lot of you will be able to do that. Secondly, we are resealing the parking lot. Uh, many of you will remember a campaign that happened to make this happen, so thank you to those of you who donated. And we will begin that resealing on April 12th. You can see the different times. This is all weather dependent, which in Pittsburgh, just try to pay attention to our website and social media as you come for events at the church, and there will be signs up uh, to help you know where to park over the next week or two. I also uh, want to extend our condolences and our prayers to the Elliott family. Jack Elliott uh, passed away about a week and a half ago. We held his funeral here yesterday, and uh, the Elliots have been longtime members of the church. And so we extend our prayers to especially Sue Elliott, who uh, her and Jack were married for, I believe, 73 years. So we continue to mourn with them and to also pray for them. I want to invite you now, as we enter the space of worship, to first greet your neighbors, to say hello to those around you, and to extend the peace of Christ to one another. Please join me in the call to worship. We have not seen the risen Christ, but we see him in the lives of those transformed by grace. We have not seen Jesus face to face, but we have seen him in the faces of our neighbors who show us his grace, peace, and love. We have not touched his wounds from the cross, but we have been called to bring healing to the wounds of the world. Let us worship the risen Lord.
merciful God, we think our best should happen when we are in control. Forgive us for not expecting the risen Christ to show us when we are anxious. Content to lock the doors of your house for fear of all that is outside. Forgive us for thinking that the church may be happens inside these walls and not into the world you so love and into which we are sent. Forgive us for looking for your power in all conventional places, but rarely in the places of brokenness, crisis, and defeat. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, repair what we are, and by the power of Christ's resurrection, raise us up to serve others for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. In Christ, we fully flourish. In the Spirit, we are part of a community of faith. By the grace of God, all are seen, loved, and made whole. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, we are forgiven. <laughs> This morning, we have the joy of welcoming new members into our community officially. Our session has already received them as members, but we as a congregation now get to give them a warm welcome as they join our church. We had a few folks that were able to join at 945. We have a few more with us in person today. And we also have some who are joining us as they worship online at Chartiers Valley and in their homes. And I think this is just a testament to the ways that our ministry goes beyond the walls of this church. And I encourage you who are in our congregation already to make your ministry go beyond the walls of this church by inviting new members out for coffee or out to play pickleball or golf or whatever you're into so that we can continue to not only be the body in our mission, but also to be the body of Christ in the depth of our community and getting to know one another and to be there for one another. So I want to invite up Beth Ketterman, one of our elders, and uh, she, oh my gosh, you're already up here. Jeez. <laughs> She's going to share some about uh, the new members who are joining. And if you are one of those new members, I invite you to come up and just kind of stand here in the chancel. And after Beth introduces you, we both have some questions to ask you and the congregation. So please come forward, new members. All right, good morning, church family. It is a joy and a pleasure to be with you as um, Laura said, as Laura said, we, are, we have welcomed 17 new members into our church family. We have a few of them here at 11. So we are going to start with Teresa. Raise your hand, Teresa. Teresa moved here recently from South Carolina, and she lives in 84 with her beautiful little daughter, Anaya. Anaya is actually getting baptized this June, so we will look forward to that. Her sisters are all in Pittsburgh, and her parents now live close by. In fact, her mom is here. Hi, Nora. Her mom is here to help with all the grandkids, so it's wonderful to have her. Teresa is a registered nurse, and she enjoys tennis, hiking, sports, and reading. Joanne Miller. Joanne? Joanne Miller lives in Bethel Park and is coming to us actually from Hamilton Presbyterian Church. She enjoys reading and gardening, so all of you Shim Garden volunteers, 
Be sure to introduce yourselves and extend an invitation to her to possibly help. Her daughter, Jamie Ferris, could not be here today, but she is also joining because Jamie is in Baltimore at a hockey tournament with one of her sons. Kristen and Sean O'Brien, on the end there, and their son, Connor, who is 10 months old, live in Upper St. Clair. Kristen comes from a Methodist background, and Sean comes from a Catholic background, and they found that Westminster was a good fit for both of them. Kristen is a, is a project manager at Allegheny Health Network, and Sean is in commercial insurance sales. So welcome. And also in person here this morning, we have Adam and Susie and Wynn, who live in Upper St. Clair with their two daughters, Ava and Julia. Ava is with us today, and Julia is with us today. Ava you would recognize because she has played the flute with the junior choir from time to time. So they moved here from Seattle about 10 years ago, and they have been visiting ever since. Both are avid Steeler fans, good choice, and they enjoy hiking, among other things. And just a little bit of history about our friends who are joining us via live stream from Chartier's Bend. Shandy, Han Sandy Shanahan, who is a longtime member here, is now a resident there. And she reached out to Chris a while ago for a copy of a hymnal so that she could copy the hymns for all the people that worship there on a Sunday morning. And Chris took one out and they've been joining us via live stream ever since. So welcoming, I'm not sure which camera to look at, but Elizabeth Henson, Nancy Pratt, Thomas Pratt, and Joy Tobin. Jan and I went out to meet with them a few weeks ago and we told them all about membership at Westminster and they have decided to join. So if you are ever on your way to lunch at OTB over the bar down in Hastings, stop by Chartres Bend and introduce yourselves to our newest church members. So I have a question, if I am on. I have a question for those of you who are joining. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, sharing its worship and mission through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, seeking to fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? With God's help, will you? And do we, the members of Westminster Presbyterian Church, welcome these newest members into our community of faith with a promise to love and support them, invite them, encourage them, and pray for them as we journey together the path God has laid before us. If so, please say, we do. We, we do. do. Let's pray. Lord, you have welcomed us into your family, and you've given us siblings in Christ to walk the journey of faith together. Thank you for these new members. Thank you for the fellowship of this community that you've brought here to Westminster and beyond. Help us to reflect your love and grace through our relationships with one another. Pray this in Christ's name, amen. Amen. Can we please welcome them? Thank you. They'll be in the back afterwards if you'd like to introduce yourselves in person. his body and sealed up the grave oh i know how you feel his death was so real but please listen and hear what i say i've just seen Just 
his voice she first heard those kind gentle words asking what was her reason for tears and I sobbed in despair my Lord is not there he said child it is I I am he That was perfect for catching us up to where we are as we approach the scripture reading in John chapter 20. Thank you both for your worship. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come today, some of us full of hope about the future and some of us full of uncertainty. We long to feel your presence revealed in the words of these ancient stories. Speak to us now and give us a message of good news for us and for the world that we can share. Amen. Scripture reading this morning takes us to the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Let us listen for God's word to us this morning. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the religious leaders, Jesus came and he stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Peace be with you. This is how the risen Jesus greets his disciples on the evening of the resurrection. A lot has happened by then. Within one weekend, Jesus was betrayed, arrested, and tried by religious leaders. He was brought before the Roman governor, he was beaten, and was crucified dead and buried, as our creed goes. Friday was a dark day. And Saturday was tragically silent. And then on Sunday morning, according to John's Gospel, Mary Magdalene arrived at the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away. And then Peter and another disciple, presumably John, ran to the tomb and saw that it was empty. Mary then encountered a man who she claimed was Jesus himself, risen from the dead. On Sunday night, the disciples were locked behind closed doors. I can imagine that their thoughts were racing, trying to make sense of this chaotic information of the past three days. They were hiding, afraid of the religious leaders who had helped to condemn and execute Jesus. The tomb was empty. Jesus was alive, maybe. But here they were. They were frozen, holding their breath, unsure of what they should do next. And here we are, the Sunday after Easter. The tomb is empty. We have proclaimed together Christ is risen. The lilies have been delivered. The eggs have been hunted. I'm assuming the visiting guests in from out of town have left, and now you are still probably vacuuming and cleaning up after hosting. And we return back this week, carrying the same burdens that we have had for weeks, months, maybe years. We're still caring for aging loved ones, still worried about our kids, maybe still searching for work, still wading through grief. The world is still in turmoil, headlines break our hearts, and death still seems to have the last word in too many places. As we meet behind the closed doors of the sanctuary, or in our homes, or the places where we live stream, Easter has come, and yet it's still complicated and messy. Where is the risen Jesus in our midst, in our mess? How can Jesus' peace break through here and in us? Jesus appears in the midst of a psychologically wounded and framed group of disciples. Even if Jesus is alive, what would it mean for them in that moment? He had still been arrested and killed, and they knew they could be next. Jesus meets them where they are, and he shows them his wounds too. They had been holding their breath, and Jesus breathes into them anew. The spirit that first hovered over chaos and darkness in Genesis 1, that same spirit comes into the chaos and darkness of the disciples' hearts and starts a new work. Recently in my house, we have seen a lot of wounds. I have a four-year-old, and he is in the Band-Aid stage of childhood. And so he comes to us constantly 
with a new boo-boo, whether it's real or imagined. Sometimes it's a bruise, sometimes it's a scrape or a cut, or sometimes it's just some marker that he got on himself and is absolutely convinced is going to need stitches. And with every mark, with every bruise, with every little cut, there is an epic story of courage or of tragedy as to where he got it. He tells us about the playground chases, of jumping over or into objects, of wrestling his sister, of tripping or not seeing a stick as he runs. Children don't mind showing their wounds and their vulnerabilities. They don't mind showing us the places where things hurt. They don't pretend like life doesn't give us wounds and boo-boos. But many of us, as we grow up, we learn to hide the wounds that we have. We learn to downplay them and to move on as quickly as we can. And many of us learn how to politely look away from the wounds of other people, whether we don't want to pry into their lives or we just really don't want to be uncomfortable. Jesus leads with the wounds of his risen body. And he leads with them and tells his disciples, peace be with you. And it is then that they're able to rejoice but Thomas, we read, Thomas wasn't there to experience all of this. Thomas is still living in the reality of Sunday morning. There was an empty tomb, there was a strange and shocking story from Mary, and Thomas hasn't made sense of all of it yet. And so the disciples, they find him, or he returns to where they are, and they tell him what they experienced. But he won't believe it. Now, Thomas was not an unfaithful disciple. Elsewhere in John's Gospel, Thomas is the one who is willing to go with Jesus to Jerusalem, even if it means that he will die with Jesus. He is someone who is realistic to the point of being fatalistic. Where Peter could not accept the dire predictions Jesus made about his death, Thomas can't bring himself to hope in the glorious ones about the resurrection. The other disciples say that Jesus is alive, but Thomas looks around and wonders, what has changed? They may be excited and hopeful, yet here they are, continuing to cower behind closed doors, still in danger. And here is their world, still with Rome in charge. The same religious leaders, the same governor, the same people milling about who turned into an angry mob just days before. The same oppressive systems are in place as there were on Friday. And so he responds, until I touch the wounds myself, I won't believe. I need to touch what connects this resurrection story you're telling me with the world that I know, and then maybe I'll believe it. I wonder how many of you came to the faith that you have. What experiences and twists and turns and people led you to be here this morning, listening and seeking God and worshiping together? For most, it was probably not just being told something that led you to trust the gospel story. Perhaps it was a person whose words were echoed and amplified by their actions, or maybe it was an experience that you had of following this way of Jesus, be it by serving or forgiving, discovering your worth, giving generously, and then finding more abundant life. Or maybe someone was wounded in a similar way and showed you their scars and invited you to walk a path of new life that they were on with Christ already. When our kids were smaller, we used to have to say a lot, look with your eyes. We still have to say this some of the time. Kids have the tendency to look by touching or grabbing or sometimes even tasting things that they want to know about and experience. Let me see usually means I want to experience this for myself. And that's how we learn. And the writers of scripture, they use this type of language to describe knowing God and learning who God is. Language of walking with God, of being in God's dwelling place, of tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. Thomas desired faith that was embodied in that way, that was connected to the messy reality that he knew. Thomas could not trust the hope of resurrection without experiencing some tangible evidence of resurrection, wounds and all. At some point in our lives, it's likely we have or we will relate to Thomas. We'll need more than words and stories to anchor us in hope, when we will need an embodied and practical faith that shows up unafraid of the wounds that we carry. A week after, a week of suspense and uncertainty and tension, 
Jesus appears again, saying, peace be with you. Jesus shows Thomas his wounds, and then he invites Thomas to touch them for himself. Jesus has been through hell and back, and he doesn't pretend it's nothing. His wounds are on full display, along with his living, breathing, risen body. The path to this new life was through the cross, and Jesus, risen and wounded, does not deny the continued reality of the world. There remains danger and bad actors and destructive powers. And yet, as Jesus told them even before his death, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. New life comes out of old wounds. And Thomas's story, it doesn't end with his doubt. He proclaims, my Lord and my God, and like the other followers of Jesus, he is sent out to follow the way of his risen Lord. Now, canonized scripture, what we find in the Bible, it kind of ends here. It doesn't tell us much more about Thomas. He's briefly mentioned at the beginning of Acts that he is there with the disciples before Pentecost, but that's where his story ends. However, there is tradition and extra canonical texts that tell us more about Thomas's story. We can take with a grain of salt, but I think that we can still learn from. Tradition holds that Thomas went to India and spread the gospel there in the mid first century. Christianity came to India long before the British Empire set foot on the subcontinent to colonize it. And one version of the story of how Thomas ended up in, Israel, or in India goes like this. The disciples, they met back in the upper room and they were trying to figure out how to logistically do the Great Commission that Jesus called them to. This makes me feel a lot better as someone that attends a lot of meetings, that from the beginning, Jesus' call involved these logistical considerations of how we do this work. And so they kind of draw lots to figure out who will go where to spread this message. And Thomas draws India as his destination. And in the story, he pushes back anywhere but India, perhaps because of the language barrier or the distance or the cultural differences. Whatever it is, Thomas is afraid and he doesn't want to go. But eventually, he realizes through a series of dreams and through persuasion of the spirit that he is called, even though he's uncertain and even though he's unqualified. And so he finds his courage and he goes. And he tells the story of Christ and he invites other people to follow Jesus' way in India. And there are many who join him and churches are born. And eventually he becomes brave enough that he is challenging the status quo so much that he becomes a martyr. Debbie Thomas, who is a writer and pastor whose parents immigrated from South India, writes about the faith that she inherited from this Thomas tradition. She writes about finding encouragement in the hesitation of Thomas in these later stories. He's emboldened to proclaim to the risen Jesus, my Lord and my God. And yet, he still again hesitates to follow Jesus when the path surprises him. He's both brave and doubtful, and his story is both beautiful and it's messy. But isn't that all of our stories? Moments of doubt interlaced with bravery, stubbornness with forgiveness, frustration with hope. Debbie Thomas writes simply, if there's room for messiness, there's room for me. Thomas's faith intermingled with doubt. He wanted tangible evidence of the resurrection and yet he struggled just as much as all the other disciples and disciples throughout time to be that evidence of the resurrection for others. But God continued to call him to bring new life from his wounds too. God chooses to continue the work of redemption and renewal through people. God knows our woundedness, God knows the messes that we're in, and still Jesus sends, and then he ascends. The Spirit remains with ordinary people to continue the extraordinary work of God in the world, and it is messy and it is beautiful still today. Christ is here in our midst, here at work, here making all things new, here offering his wounds and his peace by the power of the Holy Spirit, and through the hands and the feet of the people who are called to be his body here and now. So friends, you are part of that body of Christ. You are called to offer tangible evidence of the resurrection, not by hiding your vulnerability, but by meeting with openness this vulnerable and messy world and the vulnerable and messy people in it. We may stumble, we may doubt, we may be afraid, but I hope that the faith of Thomas will remind us that Christ still calls us, that Christ still 
reaches out and invites us to follow and to trust and to offer his peace in this world. Amen. Please stand as you are able. 
as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life of the last. Please be seated. I love that following Thomas's story, we have communion this week. This is our tangible sign of the work that Christ is doing in this body and in the world, of the unseen reality of God's renewing of all things through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And so Christ invites us to come to this table to partake in God's grace beyond our control and beyond our ability to reach it. And he invites us to come with all of our hope and our joy and all of the things that we feel capable of, and also to come with our doubt and to come with the things that we are unsure of and the things that we do not feel equipped to do. God calls us to bring all of who we are to this table and to become together the body of Christ through his spirit. And so you are invited to come. This is the Lord's table. Please join me in prayer. Time after time, you draw us here to inspire us, to feed us, to save us. Especially when our love fails, you are here, steadfast and true. You created this world and called it good. You created us to proclaim your good to all. During this season of Easter, we remember the life and ministry of Jesus, how he healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners, and preached forgiveness and peace. It was at this table that he issued the invitation to gather together, to share together, to remember together, and to go and do likewise in the world. Christ rises with the sun, light in darkness, warmth in our cold, peace and hope and joy. He went willingly to death and turned defeat and failure to victory for all. May we who in baptism die to sin rise again to new life and find our true place in his living body. May the new covenant, covenant bring healing and re reconciliation to this wounded world. Lord God, we pray this morning for those among us who need healing and reconciliation, for those in the hospital, those recovering from surgery, those undergoing treatments and procedures, may they know peace. For those who are grieving, those who are lonely, those whose hearts ache this morning, may they know peace. For those with frayed relationships, those who struggle to admit wrongdoing, those who have set difficult boundaries, may they know your peace. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, your people, and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make us lovers and tellers of your word. Make us healers and witnesses of your grace. And make us one body in Jesus Christ. As we pray together the way Christ taught his disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So when we come to the communion table, we remember that on the night that Jesus would be betrayed and arrested, he first shared a meal with his disciples. And during that meal, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God for it, he broke it, telling them, this is my body, broken for you. 
Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. As our elders come around to serve communion, you are invited to take and eat as Christ serves it to you. So please take it as soon as you would like to, and then we will share in the cup after that. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. After the meal, in the same way, after the meal, Jesus took the cup and after giving thanks to God, he poured it, telling his disciples, this is the cup of the new covenant that is sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink. This is the cup of salvation. May we take and drink and do this in remembrance of him.
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, help us to live with gratitude, to look for the best in each other, and to live charitably with all. May your resurrection never stop surprising us, disrupting us, and transforming us until Christ's kingdom comes again. Amen. comes from old wounds, and so may you not be afraid to look at the wounds in this world and to respond in faith, and may you not be afraid to heed the calling of Christ even in your doubt and in your fear and in your woundedness, because Christ continues to meet us with peace that we may go out into the world and extend that peace to all. So may we go out to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>